Welcome to Strength Chat Podcast, presented by Kabuki Strength. Introducing your hosts, Chris Duffin, the mad scientist of strength, Rudy Kadlov, mature athlete and coach, and the wizard of training himself, Brandon Sen. Welcome to Strength Chat with your host, the mad scientist of strength, Chris Duffin. To my right, we have Dr. Rudolph, our mature athlete and coach, and to my left, the wizard of training himself, Brandon Sen. Today, we've got uh, Squats and Science co-founder Jordan Burke on line with us. We're really excited to talk to Jordan. As uh, any of our listeners know, we are definitely heavily involved in uh, using VBT devices for our training. And, uh, you know, our I would call it a partnership uh, with Squats and Science has been uh, uh, quite beneficial. Um, we, we encountered, uh, what was it, a year and a half ago uh, we first met Jordan? Something so, like that. Yeah. yeah we're, we're in New Jersey. Uh, yeah. Just actually a little over a year yep. ago. And we sat down and uh, looked at uh, <laughs> one of your uh, prototype units or the ones that you were, uh, you know, providing the, the designs of. And since then, uh, you've brought two different versions to the market. Uh, you've just released a mobile app for uh, two of the platforms and just uh, really excited seeing you guys kind of grow and take off. Uh, we just received actually 50 units uh, in uh, a little while ago. And uh, really excited to have them in and uh, be using those. I'm still using the uh, uh, the old version myself. Works perfectly fine. But uh, yeah, just uh, excited to uh, to talk with you. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on with uh, squats and science these days? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, it's been I guess a little bit over a year now, and I would definitely call it a partnership. I think you guys helped us get going, and I think you're you're still helping us on the way. Um, so right now. Um, we are kind of settling down from open barbell V2 sales. Um, you know, we have a couple still arriving overseas um, and dealing with tra- tracking stuff. But otherwise, we're kind of full steam ahead on our next product. We're getting a lot of inquiries. A lot of people want to know, um, you know, if we're going to make another batch, if we're going to do a V3. It's kind of exploratory right now, but we have some really cool things we've been developing, some proprietary stuff. Some things we'll be getting patents on, but um, right now it's it's full steam ahead on on our, our new tech. Let's let's talk a little bit about uh, just for our listeners that aren't familiar with, you know, what your product is and fundamentally like, you know, VBT has been around for a while. There's some tethered units on the market that have been around. God, I think uh, how long? Maybe the 80s, 90s that the uh, the yeah. oldest unit's been around, and then 70s, uh, 80s, yeah, yeah, and then uh, there's one other one on the market that's a uh, pretty good quality, but both very, very expensive items. You know, they're not for an individual user, and then there's individual user market items out there on the market uh, for measuring velocity as well. And uh, tell us, you know, what was the impetus, and what are the things that you know separate your product from everybody else out there? Sure. So I guess. To start out with, we have to start with our, our open source stuff, right? So we we first made version 0.24. That was when we kind of released open source, which means open source basically means we're going to put all the plans out there, all the designs. So if anybody wants to make it or contribute to it or make it better, they can. And the whole purpose with that was um, I have an engineering background, and all my engineering buddies who are also big lifting nerds, um, we were all trying to make a solution ourselves because we couldn't afford Tendo units, right? This is back – back in our college days. Um, and so, you know, I saw all this kind of general effort um, in doing that. And I said, why don't we just kind of work together? And and I, I made my version. I put the source out. Um, people started to like it. Um, and then people were asking us if we're ever going to make them for people. Originally, that 0.24 was like a lot of work. You have to do a lot of 3D printing, a lot of manual assembly. Um, you have to solder everything by hand on the printed circuit board. Um, and then I think, you know, early on you guys came to us and said, we want a bunch of these things. Can you guys do that? And, and so, so that's kind of how V1 was born. Um, so, you know, we, we, we built a bunch of those, um, they sold really quickly. We built, um, a bunch of V2s about eight months later. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of the whole history behind it. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that brought us to you, Jordan, is, you know, we saw a gap in the market. There was, we wanted, we'd been using uh, velocity-based training in our facility for probably about six years now for auto regulation purposes. Uh, we had a couple high-end um, uh, units. We still do the gym wear from, uh, from Australia. 
I love them, but they're, you know, they're a couple thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we, and then we started using, um, uh, what do you, the, not Bluetooth, but, uh, yeah, we gyroscope have, versions, a, a few wearables. wearables. And we were not getting with what was on the market, the quality or, you know, accuracy that we needed. And we really felt that there, you know, VBT needs to be an individual based item. This is something that somebody should be able to own themselves and not be part of a gym. They can take it wherever they want. If they're traveling, so on, whatever gym they're training at, pull it out and manage their training with it. And, uh, right. and that was the yeah. gap in the market, the, the that, and getting a, a unit that provided the, the quality and the simplicity of use to be able to provide the data to, to, to do that. And you guys had that. And that's why, you know, we were excited to get involved with you guys and kind of, uh, be the impetus to push you in the, the direction that you're heading now. So it's uh, been been fantastic. But I just, I think that's the key thing that, you know, really separates you guys is it's a low cost, high quality, individual based, you know, unit. And uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think cost is one of the big reasons the open source initiative started. But when you guys approached us and said, Hey, can you make an official version? Um, one of the big things we considered was, um, you know, user friendliness. So, like you said, how should it be used, right? Um, if, if velocity-based training devices can be accessible to the average person, how would they want it to be used? And we, we, we agree. It should be something you throw in your gym bag. It should be something that's yours, that you take with you. Um, you shouldn't have to kind of prop it up on a tripod or something. It shouldn't be, um, you know, a big elaborate system. It should be small contained. We like the idea of having a screen on it. Um, we also like the idea of having a remote screen, if you prefer, um, be like a mobile app. Um, so yeah, some, some of the ideation kind of came, came from that. We, we, we are on the same page on that. Um, and so consumer friendly, uh, that's kind of our, our idea coming for going forward with the app because, um, you know, you want to be able to deliver a lot of these high level features. Um, so not only just giving somebody numbers, but, you know, giving somebody kind of qualitative stuff as well. And so we're trying to figure out how can we do that, um, for the average person. So as you made these steps, you know, we, we started with V1, we had a bunch there, now we're into V2. What's what's the basic difference between one and two? And and also uh, share with us the, the kind of unique attachment device that you came up with. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, we, we learned a lot after making V1. Um, if you can imagine spending nearly a month um, hand-making the same thing a hundred times, um, by the end we were like, man, we're never going to do this again, right? If we were going to do it again, we'd have to totally redo it. And so, so that's essentially what we did. We remade it from the ground up. I remember the first day we went to the computer um, and said, well, what are we going to do for our next version? And it was like we started with a blank slate, totally new document. Um, and, and that a lot of the improvements were, were structural. Um, a lot of improvements were kind of selfish as well. We wanted it to be easier to make. But in making it easier to manufacture, we also make it easier to service. Um, so that's another big benefit. Um, precision. So although the accuracy is about the same, about sub three millimeter um, per reading accuracy, it's very, it's much more precise, it's much more consistent. Um, the encoder reel spins a lot more smoothly. Um, the whole wire mechanism, we have a threaded drum, so the thread kind of uh, evens itself out while it retracts. Um, stuff like that, just a lot of little details that we wanted to improve on. Um, in regard to the, to the new attachment mechanism, uh, one of the, one of the that, that's kind of along the precision line as well. So we sat down and we said there's an issue where if the bar spins, which it does um, when you're doing even a simple back squat, it'll take the wire with it, right? It'll take the string with it if the, uh, if the, the method of attachment isn't really good. And so we said, how can we, how can we fix that and how can we make it you know, really easy to use? So we just went to the drawing board, drew up you know, 10, 20 sketches, and settled on just our, our magnetic roller attachment, which um, is kind of best of both worlds. You just it's toss awesome. it on there, it sticks, I love and it that always thing. stays on the bottom. I love that thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's so simple and so effective. It's just one of those little genius things. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I definitely experienced that uh, in using, uh, particularly like on my deadlift where I'm like <clears> rolling <throat> the bar to like really lock my grip in. Sometimes I'd wind that wheel up, uh, you know, wind that wire around and... Uh, yeah, it's right. a, literally, it's a what is it? A, one of those super magnets on a roller, right? Just yeah, it's a neodymium magnet, a really fat one, like a really heavy duty one. We did a lot of like crash testing, and that one can survive a hell of a lot. So, so it's a nice, nice heavy duty magnet. Yeah, I uh, I agree with that. 
<laughs> so Jordan, let's uh, let's talk about like what do we do with that device? So I think um, to kind of preface that for our audience, I know even um, you know clients that come to us, they don't fully grasp the concept of auto regulation, let alone auto regulating training with velocity. So uh, in your opinion, what is uh, auto regulation? So. So auto regulation is kind of a step back from velocity based training, right? So it includes not just using velocity data. You could use subjective information like like RPE, right? So how do I feel this today and, and how, how can that impact what I'm doing? Um, I think velocity is is kind of the next the next level of auto regulation in that you don't have to depend on subjective uh, ideas of, of effort. Um, you could use an objective measure, right? So the velocity never lies. That's what I like to tell people. So if they're lifting in the gym, and the speed is slower. I say, you know, hey, it's uh, it is what it is. You gotta you gotta drop the weight. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the question is, how do you implement this information? Uh, we I, I had an email just the other day. Somebody wanted to um, they wanted to use open barbell to calculate daily one rep maxes without actually doing the one rep max. Um, and they had some some trouble doing that. They were confused. They weren't sure exactly how to do it. And so I sent them an email. I'm like, hey, it's simple. You know, you just, you know, just look at this research paper here and then you just create this chart here. And then they emailed me back and they were like, dude, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it, made me, it made me kind of realize like this stuff is, is a little bit complicated, right? Um, so that's why it's nice to have somebody like you guys kind of kind of take somebody through it and, and, and interpret that data. Yeah, I know what paper you're talking about. So the I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, the study that um, was referenced in that was done with a bench press on a Smith machine. So one of the, one of the hardest things with velocity is um, it, we get that a lot even with with gym members is the idea that you know if you move slower that's instantly bad, um, which which just isn't the case. There is some issue of movement variability and that sort. But so when they did the um, research on estimated one rep max, they used a Smith machine for obvious reasons. So with that, how reliable do you think actual um, daily one or max testing is through velocity um, or have you tested different ranges, you know, through a percentage profile? So we, we created our own little spreadsheet. We, we, we haven't released it yet, um, but it's a little tool that essentially takes that formula and modifies it, right? So the way the formula works, um, hopefully I don't, you know, screw up some jargon or anything, but um, you warm up and... Uh, you take the first rep or the fastest rep uh, of each warm-up set, and then you chart it, right? And usually, you'll have a downward trend as your velocities decrease with increasing weight. And that trend, if you create a, a just a linear trend line, it'll point all the way to zero velocity, and it'll give you your LD0, or basically your load at zero velocity, right? Which is beyond your max. Nobody can max out at zero velocity, or it will take literally forever. Um, so what you do is you pull back. Right, so wherever that line points, you pull back a little bit. But how far do you pull back? Right, you pull back until your one RM velocity. Everybody's one RM velocity is different. Mine is different right now than it was a year ago when I was much stronger. Right, before I ever you know released a, a, a device. Um, and so, what we did was we we took a series of questions, um, something like um, what is your training age, what is your your current uh, fitness level, um, you know, body weight, maybe leverages, stuff like that. We ask a bunch of questions. We're playing around with the weights, like how much are those questions worth uh, in in figuring out your one RM velocity. And then we try to kind of pull back until that point. Um, we did a decent job with squat and bench. Um, deadlift was kind of all over the place. Um, but this is some stuff we're, we're, we're interested in refining as we go forward. But you're, you're totally right. Um, Taking, uh, you know, one study of a bench press on a Smith machine doesn't quite correlate to literally every person that wants to use open barbell. Yeah, that's actually really interesting. Um, you know, I don't want you to give away too much because I know some of these projects are still in development for you. But um, the questions that you're, you know, asking to, to formulate um, estimated one rep max or what have you from that, um, can you go into that uh, just a little bit more and how those questions actually relate to um, figuring that out? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's tough to answer. So we're, we're, we're trying to figure out, um, how important certain things are. Um, and you know, we're in talks with, with a lot of our, um, open barbell owners, uh, that are doing research. 
and seeing you know what they think is the most interesting thing to study because what I want to know might not necessarily be the right thing to ask yeah. um, in, a, in a research sense but we're trying to we're trying to figure that stuff out um, I, I think training age is one of the biggest uh, indicators of uh, one RM velocity but um, the training age of somebody who's five foot I mean, the, the one-arm velocity of somebody who's five foot tall is always going to be much lower than the, the one-arm velocity of somebody who's six foot tall, no matter what their training age is. So there's that as well. Um, a lot of different stuff comes into play. But, you know, it's just stuff that we're, we're trying to figure out. So, so over time, I know uh, Brandon has been recording data for a couple, couple years or longer now. And uh, as, as we progress with, with more studies... Uh, using uh, the open barbell, uh, do you see it that we could get eventually to a tool, uh, say, a, call it a matrix, uh, that would take into consideration the various variables from uh, the age of the lifter, the height of the lifter, and uh, to, to predict one rep max from the data that uh, uh, you, you get in a set or a series of sets? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's, that's definitely possible. Um, we... we... We always think when, when we're trying to figure out um, how to approach that, that problem is like, how, how can we get data from people without the, annoying them or with them yeah. still wanting to give us data, right? That's a big um, user experience or user interface question, right? If you have an app that just hammers people with questions or if you, they need to fill out 100 questions before they can go forward, they're just not going to do it. Um, we, we found people don't really like logging things like we do because we're big strength nerds. Um, but if you're talking about bringing some of this training to the average person, um, they're not, they're not going to want to log all that. Yeah. So I think that's definitely a possibility, but we got to figure out, um, how we can get away with, with it, accumulating enough information to, to get it done. But then again, on the, on the other hand, you know, you can take away the matrix and just go, once you know what your velocity is for your one rep max, then mm -hmm. on any training session, any day, you could use that calculation to figure it out. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, we know that well, I know with my training, um, all my lifts, we can, we, we know where I'm at within a couple pounds on any mm -hmm. given day. And it's pretty crazy. We've used that at meet times. Um, uh, when it came to pull that thousand, we knew I was somewhere close to hitting three reps and sure enough, that's like right where it came in. I mean, it's, it's, that's, you know, but we've got that, you know, we've got that data. We've already done that profile to know that, you know, <laughs> I can squat, you know, and bench and deadlift way down into the low teens. And that's going to be where my one RM is. So, right. You know, once you've got that established, it's it's a pretty easy calculation to, to figure out. Agreed. And that, that's kind of a clever way of going about it. Right. So you just kind of you say, all right, we need to get this information. So let's let's figure out right off the bat what that one arm velocity is. So let's do some testing or let's try to figure it out. So, yeah, I mean, and, and there, there's some some studies out there that say the last rep of a plus set or, or um, an MRAP set or something. Um, is indicative of one RM velocity as well. So mm -hmm. you can kind of have somebody do an AMRAP set, which people do usually more frequently than than um, one RM testing. I think I've come to the same conclusion as you as well in regards to training age. Uh, you know, when all of our clientele that we have gets one of your velocity devices when they come on with us, um, and one thing that we found is is trends across different populations of lifters. Generally speaking, lifters with a lower training age tend to not be able to finish weights as slow as someone with, you know, maybe like Chris that has a higher neural efficiency. So I think um, one of the potentials for actually coming up with a set of questionnaires, you might be able to bypass the entire velocity. You know, essentially what we're talking about uh, is velocity profiling. So I think one thing that you could eventually get to is maybe not being as accurate, but creating more of a range of velocities um, in that profile if you had those questions. So that's something that I'll be really interested in to follow up uh, with you when you uh, refine that. Yeah, it's, it's just going to take data. Just, just a quick quest, side question. So is, is, is velocity profiling uh, acceptable in the new Trump America, Brandon? In the new Trump America? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> it's all I got going. <laughs> That's good. He's the he's the preeminent velocity profiler. So Jordan, you know, another thing that we haven't touched on yet, but velocity is more related to percentage than it is load. Is that correct? Um yeah, yeah, yeah. So um velocity is um is shown to be proportional to your RPE, which is 
is definitely proportional to your your uh, percentage of one RM. Yeah. So one thing that we we really like about using velocity uh, with our clientele is we don't always have to know their exact one rep max. So oftentimes, you know, because we're really heavily involved in the movement side of things with Kabuki.ms, a lot of times we get clients who want um, or who are coming on injured uh, or, you know, for whatever reason, we can't quite push them to those higher intensities. So not knowing their one rep max, we can still give them um, percentages or training loads to follow um, mm. instead of using past data. We can always use uh, the most current data with um, velocity. And that's one of the biggest benefits, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and one thing, I mean, you guys far and away handle more more athletes than I've, I probably ever will. Um, so you guys get to see a lot of that variability. You guys get to kind of uh, measure that against what the num what numbers you get back, which is which is really useful. It's something that we're we're going to try to take advantage of once we get um, our kind of app sending data back to our server. Um, what I see a lot in my day-to-day -day life uh, at SNS Barbell um, is people using it in, in person, right? So I get to, to kind of look at them and I get to judge their RPE. So I do kind of like a um, kind of an on-the-fly um, RPE velocity chart. Um, and that's kind of how I, I get to gauge it. So when people jump on a velocity program with me, the first day I say, all right, let's work up to about an 8 RPE. And then with that 8 RPE, we kind of measure it and we see what velocity they end up at. And then, you know, in, in person, it really helps because <clears throat> if a person's brand new, they might not be that great at judging their RPE. But, I mean, I could take my experience and I could look at them and I could say, all right, uh, we're going to call that around an 8 RPE. We'll look at the velocity and then we can kind of use that as a way to scale. And then over time, right, that's not perfect. It's just one session. That's just one day. We can kind of narrow in on, on the velocity range that we use. Yeah, I think there's a really big potential for creating a bigger profile, a load profile that uh, attempts to correlate velocity, uh, you know, percentages from zero to 100, and then RPE, which would be more of like an exertion profile. Um, you know, what you're talking about is kind of like using the coach's eye, right? You know, learning how to view the athlete. Right. And even if something is a higher RPE, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean we want them to go in past their technical abilities as well. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times, even when we profile lifters, we'll tell them to obviously move the bar as fast as you can, but don't escape your technical limits within mm -hmm. that velocity. Right. But I mean, that, that, that's the beauty of it right there. I mean, you've done that one session and now you got them a definitive measurement of like, this basically equivalents to an eight RPE. So if you're not there the next session, you know, they've got, you know, a marker, you know, they've got some of that, you know, non-subjective, you know, method for looking at uh, their training load and where they're at. Right. Which, by the way, you know, when you put that in practice, makes me hate your product. By the way. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I'm in a workout and I'm like three or four sets in and I'm like, God, I think I'm done. You know, I think I'm done. And I look down at the device and it's like, it's like nope, no drop off. There's still I'm yeah. still good. Oh shit! It looks like I got to add another ten pounds on here today. <laughs> Damn you! I hate you. <laughs> it's, it's amazing it's a, because we have a group of lifters that come in and they're all on, you know, around a similar type of VBT uh, program, and they have this day. It's like a, a one RM, uh, not not one RM. It's like um, we drop the velocity for a single rep on, let's say, squat. Right. So throughout your program, the velocity will go down and down and down. And so they do these singles, and they're like, okay, I'm going to go, you know, kind of to where I was uh, or how strong I think I'll be today to get that velocity, and they'll be fast. And like, all right, well, I guess I'll go up 10 pounds. They'll still be fast. Okay, 10 more pounds, and they'll still be too fast. And it'll be like, well, they'll, they'll be like kind of pissed off at the same time. Like, I mean, hey, I'm hitting more than I ever hit, yeah. I guess, and it's still moving fast. But, you know, so that, it's like, that, that, and that's what we've – but the after effects of that is what we see and what we love because – you know, think about that's one session and then add that over three months, six months, mm -hmm. a year. How much are people leaving on the table, you know, and then there's going to be the other sessions where you have to call it, you know, call it short when you didn't anticipate it too. Um, but that's, I mean, that's auto regulation. I mean, that's, and that's, you know, making sure that you get, you know, everything out of it. And I know, you know, Brandon can attest to this. I mean, this is, we, we constantly see people that have, come off of RPE based methods and take up the, the VBT with us. 
and they make so much progress over you know six nine month year period uh, because they're they're able to get more work in because like I said that third set in if I was go listening to my subjective feedback it's like man that felt hard I think I'm done I think I'm gonna call it I know I got four sets scheduled today but I'm supposed to be good quality da 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 you know but I think that's it you look down. Damn, I hate you, Velocity Device. <laughs> Another set. <laughs> velocity, don't lie. Yeah. Right? But that adds up over time. You that, know? You know, one thing you mentioned there, there's definitely a skill to regulate and load with RPE. Um, and I think you can make the argument ac- across the board for aggressive lifters or, you know, more um, relaxed, maybe lackadaisical lifters. But Velocity kind of just spits you the, the truth, you know, no matter what. I, I think you could also make the argument that movement variability uh, could sway velocity a bit. Um, however, it's still telling you exactly what just happened. You know, And I, I think making decisions based on the velocity, there is some subjectivity into that. So just because something's slower or faster doesn't indicate that you should immediately make a decision to go up or down. You know, We, we have to then potentially ask the question, well, why was that? Um, is it purely from you know, fatigue or was, uh, you know, did I, uh, miss groove a rep or, so there is uh, definitely, even though this is, am, am I squatting high today? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, are you squatting low today? Yeah, that's a better question. I know. I know yeah. That, that. <laughs> right. But and, the, and, and so movement variability, right. That's, that's a good point. Another good point is people like some kind of subconsciously cheating themselves. Um, uh, a good example is a deadlift. So, um, you mentioned, am I squatting high, right? Well, you could also imagine, am I not locking out enough on deadlift, right? You can kind of cut your lockout short, um, and it'll feel like a completed rep if you're really tired and you're not really doing it on purpose. Um, but if you look at the open barbell and you go to the range of motion, it'll tell you. It'll say, this deadlift is you know, 30 millimeters shorter than your last four deadlifts. And so you'll know, maybe I didn't lock that last one out as much, and that's why my velocities went down, right? So maybe you don't need to go down and wait. Maybe you're just fatigued and you're not finishing a lift and that's changing your numbers. I think but that's where that range of motion kind of comes in handy. Yeah. The range of motion, um, stat on there is awesome. I think it's definitely one of the more underutilized pieces of the open barbell across, um, at least lifters that I've encountered, but you know, we're all trying to get to the, you know, to answer some sort of question of, should I go up or down and load with this? Right. Um, one of the things that I've noticed with the range of motion feature is even when you're fatigued a lot, the range of motion almost tends to increase. You know, it, maybe on a bench press, you start to flatten out a little bit. Um, on a squat, maybe you really try and dunk it and hits, uh, hit your uh, stretch reflex really hard. So there's you're definitely... Just, you're not holding your torso is upright and you're, yeah, bending, you're bending over yeah. more. So there's definitely like, that's that's a really interesting avenue to pursue eventually. And, in, in, you know, I don't know that there's been any studies done yet, but looking at range of motion as fatigue accumulates and, and that sort. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, we're, we're just starting to scratch the surface of what we can actually do with this device. And, um, you know, I think um, as, as research progresses and, and we get more users on it and we use it more, um, we're going to be able to do so much more than we currently are even. I want to take a step uh, off of something you said there, Brandon. So you said, you know, with the velocity, we're trying to figure out whether to go up or down. And Jordan, I know you're on the same page with us, but like we said, you know, uh, Tendo units came out. What you, you're, you're thinking sometime in the 70s, Brandon? Yeah, you know, it, definitely in the before 80s. Before my time. Um, before you were born, little one. Um, <laughs> that was about when Rudy was in, uh, I don't know, his 30s. But, but you know, so for so long, people used velocity devices to, like, work on being faster and not for the auto regulation purposes of it. And like, there's other auto regulation tools out there. I know there's heart rate variability. Um, that's probably one of the, the, the other big ones, but in the end, it's all, everything comes down to one thing. What's happening with the bar, how well you recovered. So you could have done your HRV measurement in the morning and it tells you, Hey, you're, you're, you're over fatigued, you know, take it easy today. What does take it easy mean? Like, does it mean I go five pounds less? Does it mean I don't work out? Does it mean mm-hmm. like, and then it, you know, you're finding out after the fact, like, oh, yesterday I worked out too hard. You know, again, you know, right now, right now I've got this bar in my hand. What, what decision am I going to make? And all those other factors, everything that you're, everything compiled all comes down to the output of being what's going to happen to the bar. Mm-hmm. So measuring velocity covers every thing in my opinion 
Yeah. Because it, it, it could be mental. It could be neuro. It could be, you know, it could be movement. It could, you know, all these things all add up to what's going to mm-hmm. happen to that bar. Right. And, and, and how can you make it actionable? Right. So what exactly. can you do with the data? So, yeah, that's uh, that, that's something I, I learned in my uh, my operations and engineering background is uh, there was a lot of people, you know, uh, statistical process control was really huge. And you go into some facilities and they've just got all this charting and charting and charting. And it's like, what action are you taking? Mm. You know, it's like, okay, if you get outside the control charts, here's action that you need to take. If you've been out for mm. so long, now you advance the action to this. And now you, like, that's what everything should be driving you to make a decision. And what kind of decision do you make instead of just collecting data to file away, which is right. what some, some people do and go, oh, look, I'm doing SPC. Here's all these folders for the last 20 years. You want to look at them? <laughs> Yes, I would love to. <laughs> like, well, you know, what, what, what did you do? <laughs> it's it's right. interesting because we've got engineers talking to engineers here. And not all of our listeners are engineers. And I, for one, am an old college football coach. So I want to get it down to a level <laughs> that myself or some of my, uh, my uh, players would understand. And when we talk about how many variables there are uh, in VPT, uh, we talked about range of, adding range of motion. We talked about the level of, uh, of skill or technique. We talked about the age of the lifter. At some point, how do we boil it all down so that the actionable uh, item for a, an average lifter, he buys a, a open barbell, he gets it out of the package, he hooks it up on the bar, he records some data, and then what? You know, how does I'll, I'll he really t- apply I'll tell you it? what he does. He goes to kabukistrength.com. <laughs> and signs up. He signs up <laughs> and he gets, nor he just goes to Brandon's page and he downloads the auto regulation book of methods, gets a free uh, velocity profiling with it, mm-hmm. and uh, basically converts it you know, into a percentage based system. It's not uh, so, so that's, it's not that's essentially our answer, too. Just go to kabukistrength.com. <laughs> but we, we, we that, so it's a good question. So, what, what do you, how can you get qualitative data? And, 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 when, when we talk about what we're trying to do next um, and some of the stuff that we're trying to do, um, if we want to take this, these numbers and create qualitative results, um, we're not trying to, to make a, a device that's a coach. We're trying to make a device that gives coaches really good tools. Yes. Um, so instead of um, Brandon trying to, trying to find patterns in 100 different lifters at the same time, what if we could just group his lifters by certain uh, result patterns, right? So maybe we could say that this group looks a little over fatigued from, from his programming. Maybe we should kind of push that to the top of his queue and he can investigate why. Or maybe we could just kind of have the device making some decisions that Brandon would make uh, autonomously, right? Some changes in RPE on the fly, some changes of load on the fly. And so that way Brandon could just look at the results at the end and they make uh, kind of bigger decisions. So I, I think we're, we're in the, uh, the making tools for coaches uh, uh, department. So, you know, and let's, let's, let's try to simplify it from that even further for, for our listener. Like, cause it does, it, it sounds really complicated on the outside when you're talking about like yeah, it does. VBT, you know, auto regulation, but like a normal, a normal, you know, training method is to go, well, total is a coach. You know, I want my athlete to get this weekend, 12 repetitions between 80 and 85% of their one rep max. Right. So all we do is once you've got the, you know, you know what they're correlating. So you run the profile. Those are certain velocities. So let's say 80% equates to 0.35 meters per second. 85% equates to 0.30 meters per second. You know, so what you do is you assign the lifter to hit 12 repetitions between 0.35 and 0.30 meters per second instead of 80 to 85%. And what that allows us to do is, you know, that... 80, the 80 to 85% is fixed, but the 30 to 35 is variable based on how they've recovered and how they're prepped to train that day. So, so that, that number is going to shift based on their recovery, you know, either above or below pan or maybe the right on plan. So in the essence, that's, that it's really simple. It's basically, you can think about it as just percentage based training, except we're, we're using a moving percentage based on your daily max. A percentage that dynamically Dynam- adjusts to, exactly. your, to your preparedness and your current state of training. Mm-hmm. But uh, 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 
an athlete really needs a coach to help them through that at that point because uh, it, can they really can they really auto regulate really determine by themselves what's and, causing the variance? No, I don't. I don't think there are anybody. Jordan, do you guys have like any like basic templates? We don't do. We don't have any basic templates or stuff like that. So it is like Jordan says. It's a it's a coaching tool right now. Um, or if somebody's playing with those methods, they can take this stuff and interpret and build their own. I think I think making a template for a velocity-based program is a little bit better than making a template for a percentage-based program because at least with the, the auto-regulated program, it kind of changes for you a little bit, right? Even throughout the day, like, you know, if you're getting slower, faster, and you're fatiguing faster, um, a, VBT pro, a generalized VBT program could be better. But even then, uh, no, we don't offer that because it's, it should be individualized. Um, we, we have some kind of internal templates that we use to kind of base people's programming off of, but every single person that uses it, it changes slightly just for them. Yeah. Yeah, to... I, I think, I think that that's an opportunity and we would like to go down that route ourselves in the future. Uh, but right now I'm not aware of any products that exist, you know, that mm -hmm. can, you can just pull off the shelf and go, Oh, here's the, here's the thing that I'm going to follow. Yeah. To answer to, I, I give you my opinion, Rudy. Um, I, I think the individual can do this on their own as long as they have the systems ready to manage the data incoming. So a lot of times, uh, I've answered questions with people on Instagram or, or anyone who's just recently picked up a device who, um, you know, is wanting to know what to do with it. They they have to have some basis to correlate the data that they're getting from. It's it they they can't just put it onto the bar and then go to town. There is going to be some data management that has to happen from that point whether it's through a generalized um, uh, scale or an actual velocity profile. But I, th I do think the, you know you can have an individual on this device. They can use it uh, incredibly effective as long as they have the systems to manage the data that's coming off of it. Well, maybe that should be our next venture with Squats and Science is to help create that system, I mean, in, to improve the marketability of the product. We know the product's good by the virtue of the fact that we use it, but we know what we're doing. I mean, to, to be able to create some uh, some matrices or, or you know, step-by-step -step approach and might be a, a great next step for, for everybody. We have some, some really interesting plans for the generalized um, training program. Um, I mean, if you think about it, what can a coach do if they can see everybody who's using their generalized training program? Right now, it's just kind of, if you have one, you release it to the wild and people can do with it as they wish. Um, but, you know, what if you can kind of see into that? So it's something we're kind of playing with. Yeah, and to piggyback on that, Rudy, we do have that created. All of our athletes get that. Sure. But, you know, it comes in the form of uh, an Excel, uh, you know, spreadsheet, and that's not uh, – there is some if – you're, if you're not too savvy on it, there is some learning that would have to be done in order for someone who's not, you know, interested in Excel or how to use that to be able to use that. But I think that's the next step in the industry and in taking people to make this a usable tool and not just collecting data or trying to be faster is to have some sort of web-based model or something that is managing. Yeah, that. so yeah. yeah, that would be good. Uh, but uh, so the best answer right now is when you get your open barbell and unpackage it, uh, then log on to kabukistrength.com and, and uh, come, that's right. <laughs> come ask for help. <laughs> we'll show you the way. <laughs> Or just go to squatsandscience.com, and then I will forward you to kabukistrength.com. <laughs> now you guys have a lot of good info out there too. So yeah, and you know, uh, from a just to kind of talk about your company for a minute and in, in our experience, you, you guys have been awesome with repairs. Any questions Absolutely. we have from our athletes? I mean, no question. It's I, I don't think this level of service would happen through any other um, through any other distributor or, or company and so we've we've been incredibly happy with that you know we have no hesitation to say when you know whether for whether or not it's their fault or you know maybe they dropped the device whatever but um you guys have been awesome in in helping our athletes get their devices yeah. fixed get them back on on the and, road and training and, and we've dealt with a lot of the companies in the market doing bbt devices and yeah. um we we yeah. highly, i mean you, you're our guys so yep yeah yeah i i think i I, I missed the last thing you said. Um, I said so you're. Hope... I said you're our guys. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And, and you just wanted the... to hear it twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, thanks for the kind words about the repairs. We we put a lot of effort into that because, you know, if you buy an Apple laptop and you want it repaired, it's not going to go to um, uh, what's his name. 
Cook Cook's desk. He's not going to see that you want to get your laptop repaired. If he did, I'm sure he'd say, let's repair this guy's laptop. Um, but every time you have an open barbell that needs servicing, it goes to the owners of the company's desk. And so, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I don't know how I would be able to see that and say, no, I'm not going to fix it for you. Um, yeah, just send it to me. I'll fix it. Yeah, that's been something that we've been incredibly impressed with and, and very uh, thankful for. Yeah. Well. So, uh, you know, we hear some of the noise in the background. Not quite as bad as the last podcast we had, but uh, tell everybody where you are right now. And if they want to, if they happen to be close, where they can stop in and say hello. Sure, yeah. So um, right now I am in SNS Barbell. So SNS Barbell is a 24 hour uh, a strength gym in, in Brooklyn and Williamsburg. Um, it's also our testing facility. So all of our new tech, um, we had several open barbells in here before they were released. Um, and we had our lifters try as hard as they can to break them so we can make sure it doesn't happen uh, in, in people's homes. Um, so yeah, if you guys want to come by, uh, please take your devices with you and I'll, I'll, I'll play around with you and, and, uh, and see what we can, what we can figure out. Also, Squatsandscience.com is the other resource. There's mm -hmm. some unhappy person back there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Williamsburg traffic for you, man. <laughs> well, Jordan, uh, outside of the gym and, and, and your website, squatsandscience.com, is there any uh, other resources that you, you want to um, you know, direct our audience to? Um, yeah, so we're, we're going to be trying to put out some resources soon if you go to squatsandscience.com. I know, Brandon, uh, I tried working with you. I tried working with you uh, a little bit ago on getting a, an article released, and so hopefully we can get that done soon. Yeah. Um, kind of a little bit of, uh, of a four-in-one on, on VBT stuff. Um, so, yeah, um, just keep an eye out on, on our website and our social media, and, uh, and we'll, be, we'll be putting some info soon about, about what we're doing next. All right. You want to throw out uh, some of those social media links, too, while we're on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Squats and Science uh, on Instagram. Um, that's pretty much our, our hub of social media. We don't really pl play around too much in the world of, of the Facebooks and the, and the YouTubes. Um, that's, so, uh, so, yeah, if you head there, you'll, you'll probably see our latest. Awesome. Well, it's uh, been great having you on the line today, Jordan. And, uh... That was a Thanks. toot toot goodbye, I guess, for the train. <laughs> <laughs> that's the last train of the morning. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right, Jordan. Well, thank you for uh, taking the time to sit down and chat with us today, and uh, hopefully we'll look forward to the next one. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Thanks, All right. Jordan. Thanks, Jordan. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.